Hey, this is Rachel Cruz, and this is the Earn and Invest podcast. I went to the dentist today, which was nothing out of the ordinary. I just had a typical cleaning, but it reminds me of a time I went 10 years ago with my wife. At the time, we had the same dentist, and on that visit, we both had issues. She had a cavity, which per her usual, she came back a few weeks later and had it fixed, and I had a chipped tooth. And the dentist made sure to tell me that I needed to get this fixed because otherwise it would erode into a cavity and cause me problems. Now, I'm a physician, and sometimes I think of myself as a little more important than I am, and I was very busy seeing patients, doing all sorts of things, and a week became a month, and a month became two months, and eventually, six months later, I still hadn't had this tooth chip fix, and I went back for my six-month appointment, and the dentist wasn't happy. In fact, he lit into me. He tried to explain that, look, I told you the right thing to do, and you didn't do it this will cause you problems. You really need to get this fixed. Eventually, I decided to leave that dentist. I just felt like my personality and his personality didn't mesh. But it started to make me think about other things in life. You see, this dentist I didn't mesh with, but then I found a new dentist. And that dentist was a little bit more understanding and worked with my schedule a little bit more. And when I failed to do something he suggested he would delve into why, and then we would find a better solution. And I think we do this a lot in life in general, not just with our medical and dental health, but also with our financial. Some people, like my wife, prefer to take advice like medicine, straight up, no frills. Others, like me, sometimes need a teaspoon of sugar to help the medicine go down. Rachel Cruz is a New York Times bestselling author, host of the Rachel Cruz Show and Podcast, and uses her knowledge and experiences growing up in the Ramsey household to educate others. Rachel, happy to have you on the Earn and Invest podcast. Yes, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I once heard you tell a story of when you were 15 years old and you bounced some checks. And your father, Dave Ramsey, made you go to the bank branch manager and apologize. And in some ways, his brand of personal finance is a little bit more fire and brimstone. Compare your own version and personal style when it comes to personal finance. Yeah, I mean, I think personality-wise, it comes out, right? So like his personality, if you're, I don't know if you're familiar with the Enneagram at all, but he's very much an Enneagram. A, he's a challenger and you hear that straight up from the radio, if you listen to the podcasts, read the books, I mean, all of it, like that is him. And it was funny, I started this working here and traveling and speaking about, I mean, close to a decade ago, which is just wild. And for a while, I felt like, okay, I needed to be that. Like I, I, and I, and I'm a challenger in my own way. I'm kind of aggressive in my personality at times. So I was like, okay, I got to lean on all of that to be successful. And then I realized maybe a year or two in, I was like, no, I just need to be me because I am confident that I can connect with people by just being Rachel. And so my my personality very much shines through of what you, if you have listened to any of my podcasts or seen my shows, like that is me. And my my approach is much more probably friendly. I would say it's, I'm more like your best friends walking beside you in this journey where dad, people are like, oh yeah, it's Uncle Dave. He's kind of like your old uncle that's like at Christmas, you know, telling you what to do kind of thing. So yeah, I definitely take more of a peer-to-peer approach, but I like that's how I do life as well. You mentioned the Enneagram and personality, but certainly your parents' beliefs also about finances probably had to do with their experiences. And am I correct in saying that you were about six months old when your mom and dad filed for bankruptcy? Yes, that's right. I was born in April and they filed in September. So just a few months old. And that whole journey for them began with me as a brand new baby. And my sister was a toddler at the time. I was about to say, how do you think that affected your financial education and teaching from your parents as a kid? Oh, gosh. I mean, obviously, I don't remember the initial bankruptcy because I was six months old. But the repercussions of that and the decisions that they had to make to just survive, you know, that come into my head, you know, five, six years old, whether it was never going on vacation, never going out to eat, shopping at consignment sales, like all that lifestyle was still present when I was younger. 
And then once, you know, that they realized, okay, here's how we need to handle money. And dad started his radio show, you know, was writing books, started the company, all of that. And as that grew, they were able to still stay within those principles. Like no matter how much income they were making, the principles stayed the same. So for me, I was ingrained with these principles from as early as I can remember. And I'm so thankful for that. Like I really am. I think I was too, I was able to avoid a lot of hardship when it came to money, not because of the dollar amounts in my bank account, but because of the principles that I've leaned so strongly on throughout my life and ones that work. You know, no matter what you if you have if you make thirty thousand dollars a year or three million dollars a year, the principles we teach work. And that's been that's been such a gift. One of those early life lessons I imagine is the value of a dollar. And I know you've talked before about how you guys were paid for chores. You didn't just naturally get an allowance. So you learned a lot of fiscal responsibility as a kid. Did you guys ever talk about the softer side of personal finance? Was there ever talk about how money felt or not having money felt? Yeah, sometimes. I mean, the emotional side it probably wasn't as strong as the tactical because I think when we were younger and they were teaching us, there was still an element of survival that they had of like, we got to get we got to get food on the table still. But very much. And I think that the heart issue of money is something that a lot of people don't touch on. But those 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 values like contentment and avoiding jealousy and envy and not making money your God and your everything, like how to implement all of those in your heart is so crucial because you can win with the tactical, but man, if you don't have, if you don't have the character in your heart to carry that stuff, like it can absolutely eat away at your soul, honestly. I like that too, because you can win with the tactical, But if you don't understand why you're doing what you're doing, it doesn't help very much. And in fact, I've heard you describe yourself as a spender at heart who loves pizza and hates budgeting. So put away the pizza (laughs) part, but that doesn't sound like your typical personal finance person. I know, I know. Yes, I am a natural spender. I mean, I've learned to save money, obviously, because it's wise and I'm not, you know, immature in my ways of handling with money. Like I know principally like what to do and how to do it and I do it. But man, I can spend money so easily. I do. I enjoy it. I really do. And the budgeting thing, yeah, that was the one part of personal finance that was so hard for me to get on board with because number one, I'm a spender. So I thought every time the word budget came up, or at least in my experience growing up, is that a budget meant, yeah, you can't go shopping, you can't go out to eat, you can't go on vacation because you're on a budget. And it's like, gosh, people on budgets are not fun. Like if that's your life on a budget, like I want to enjoy life. And so it just felt restrictive instead of a freedom aspect. And so harnessing after I got married, like realizing, okay, no, we need to do a budget together. We need to work together. And I did it honestly more from the head versus the heart. And now being on a budget though for so long, it's come to my heart now. My heart's changed with it because now I realize that a budget is permission to spend. A budget allows you and shows you what you can spend. And that boundary and that guardrail is so healthy to have in your life when it comes to money. And so now, I, now I'm now i good with the budget. I'm not mad at it. But for, for years, God, I, it was hard for me. It really was. I love this talk of the dichotomy of dealing with both the head and the heart. Let's talk about what's happening in the world today. We are in the midst of a pandemic, a recession, social unrest. These are unprecedented times. Do you think that we have to pivot as people who talk about personal finance more to either the head or the heart now that the world has kind of changed on us? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think people have a lot of fear when it comes to their money. I think the the financial side and the health side of this whole pandemic has rocked people to their core. And, you know, people that were living with a lot of debt and were living paycheck to paycheck and they got furloughed or they got laid off, you know, the millions and millions, tens of millions that that happened to it's a hard reality and a hard wake up call that they've experienced. And so for me, you know, my position has been one of hope of like, hey, how do I guide these people, give them the steps they need, but also showing them like, you don't have to make decisions based on fear. You don't have to let the fear of this completely paralyze you. You can still move forward and giving them the steps on how to do that. But you first have to overcome this, this fear. And, and maybe those that weren't even furloughed or laid off, the fear of it happening, right? I mean, like I remember even March, April, like even at Ramsey Solutions, we were like, we, had, we, we wrote up worst case scenarios in the operating board of like, we don't know. Like, what if this whole thing just like, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen in that? And I think for anyone, it is, it, it kind of took your breath away there for a few weeks and for some people, a few months. But I think... Now getting more facts under us, I think has helped 
people out there for sure. And and I think at this point, people are kind of fatigued. It just has felt like a really dark time for a long time. And so being able to insert hope in this money message for us in personal finance is really important. It's one of the things I really love about Ramsey Solutions is the tactics are there and written down and teachable. Do you find the mindset is harder to teach? Gosh, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I think that the behavior side of the person is the hardest. And we say that all the time that personal finance, it's 80% behavior. It's only 20% head knowledge. You know, what we teach our principles are not hard to understand. Live on less than you make. Don't take on debt. Get out of debt. Live on a budget. You know, those things are very simple. I mean, an eighth grader can do the math and figure out how to do this, right? I mean, it's not hard to understand. When you get into the investing world and all that, it gets way more complicated. So we send people, the professionals, we let them deal with that side of it. But on just the basic personal finance side, you know, it's easy to understand, but it's so hard to do in changing people's behavior or getting them to understand they need to change their behavior. Oh yeah, that can be very difficult. And, you know, I say it all the time, but it's true. Like, you know, I talk to people and they are just, they're mad about their situation and they're angry and they're ready to change. And you hear it in their voice and they're like, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm ready to do something different. I work so hard. I have nothing to show for it. Like, oh, and I'm like, oh yeah, those are the people that will sacrifice and get out of debt. And then I talk to some people and they're like, yeah, I kind of sort of think maybe one day I might get out of debt. I'm not really sure. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you probably won't. Like, like the urgency isn't in you to change your behavior because the sacrifice you don't feel like is worth it right now. And so... Yeah, that's that. That's the interesting part about my job is the behavior side is so important. And just like most things in life, right? Whether it's health and fitness, I mean, all of it, it's changing your behavior is what's key. Look forward a year or two. Let's say our economy improves. We find some way to wrangle this pandemic under control. Maybe social unrest improves a little bit. How do you see us looking in a few years? How are people going to be affected by 2020 financially? Is it going to change their behavior from here on out? As I was just talking about hope, I might be Debbie down here for a second. (laughs) But, you know, I look back in 07 during the recession, 07 and 08. And just within a few years, credit card debt was back to where it was. Car loans were back. I mean, people were back living paycheck to paycheck. It's almost like they forgot. So I wouldn't be shocked if we looked up in two years and people's spending habits or the way they handle money we're still the same. Like they quote unquote, didn't learn the lesson of if something bad happens, what are we going to do? I hope it does though. I hope this was people's wake up call to say, you know what? I want to have this like never again moment. Like this never again, am I going to be freaked out to lose my job and not know where the paycheck's coming from? Never again, am I going to say, wow, we have nothing in savings. And you know, again, if we're furloughed, we don't know what's going to happen. Like the, those moments I'm praying where a, was a line in the sands for people where they said, no matter what, I'm changing the way I'm handling money. That's my prayer and my hope. Whether that's true for most of America, I have no idea. Sadly, history has shown no, we go back into our patterns and the way we live life. But I, I would hope, I would hope that we learn some really, really good lessons out of this. Yeah, sometimes it feels like we have a short memory. Part of that might be the social media bombarding us day in and day out. One of your recent books, Love Your Life, Not Theirs, talks a lot about keeping up with the Joneses and the problem with comparison. In fact, you've even talked in the past about Instagram envy. What's going on with people? Why do we feel compelled to compare ourselves to everyone else? Yeah, social media is a hard one because for the most part, people put their best foot forward, right? It's the best part of your life that you're showing and that you're excited about. And that's what everyone's seeing. And so when that's all you're seeing on people's feed and you're scrolling and it's all good, 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 you're like, oh man, like I, my life isn't that good, right? No one's life is that good. And so you start to become discontent and you start to find yourself wanting a better vacation, wanting a better car, wanting a different kitchen. I mean, you fill in the blank and it, it can be so, so difficult. And never in the history of our world have we been able to look into, inside someone's life so intimately because of social media. I'm like, you never would know that someone bought a new car unless you saw them driving in the neighborhood or going to dinner together. I mean, you know, that that just never happened. And so it was kind of this new frontier. And yeah, the comparison game, it's out there. And what's hard about it is no one wins. Like when you're playing this game, you either come out feeling inferior, like, oh yeah, I'm better than that person. My car is nicer than them. My my house is better decorated than hers. You know, you come out inferior or or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, superior. Or you come out inferior where you're like, oh, everyone's just better than me. And so 
you don't win. Like neither one of those, it's, it's, it's really, really a hard cycle to be in. And so to get out of that comparison game is really key, not just for your heart, but for your, for your checking account too. So clearly with everything going on in the world and then us being able to readily compare ourselves to others, there is a lot of fear and anxiety. What's the best way for us to manage this? Like, how do we not succumb to all this and feel like there isn't hope? Yes. Well, number one, focus on facts. I think this is really important to say, okay, what is the facts that's going on? Not the hyperbole, not not all the, the fear mongering that's been going on. Like truly, what are the facts of your situation? Seeing, okay, this is how much debt we have. Here's how much we have in savings. Here's the the industry I'm in, and my industry is not getting furloughed or laid off, so I'm probably going to be okay in this job. You know, you have to focus on the facts. Or if you are laid off, here are the facts. Here's unemployment. Here's where my my industry is completely turned upside down. We have to find a new job. Like focusing on those facts is key. Getting all tied up in the emotion side is really really dangerous, and you make bad financial decisions when it's all out of fear. So finding the truth and finding the control. What can you control? And focusing on those facts is really important. And then I'd say number two, it's tactical, but it's true, is is to budget and say, okay, during this time financially, it's really scary. So we need to make sure that our needs are taken care of. Our food, our shelter, utilities, and transportation. And just being able to fund those and know, okay, this is what we need to survive. And we can put money towards this. I'm going to take on an extra job. Do whatever I have to do. This is covered. Okay. That gives you a peace of mind that you're not going to be falling behind. And that's that's so key. And then number three, understanding that money flows two ways. It flows in and it flows out. So what can you do to bring in more money if you need to? And what can you do to cut expenses if you need to? And again, there are millions of Americans that need that and they're going to have to do both. And then some people listening, they haven't lost their job. Like they've been trucking along just like normal. And so that's what's, that's what's important is to know your position and where you're at. So that's number one. Again, facts to your friends. Stick to what you can control. Number two, do a budget. Make sure those needs are, are top of the list and that you can fund those. And then number three, C, do I need to bring in more income? Do I need to slow the outgo of the money going out of our house? We've been talking about fear and it jogs a memory of seeing you, I think it was on Good Morning America a few months ago with your father. And the host asked something to the extent of what's the most important thing to getting through right now in the midst of this pandemic and everything. And you spoke about fear. And then they went and asked your father, Dave Ramsey, a similar question. And he started talking about the four walls and the framework and much more tactical, but it was funny. He stopped in the middle and said, but I want to go back and talk about the fear for a moment. Mm. I thought that was a pivotal moment in my understanding of Ramsey solutions, because I feel like you have affected the message quite a bit. And especially talking about these things like fear and anxiety, tell me, looking forward five, 10 years from now, what do you think will be the legacy of Rachel Cruz on the Ramsey message? Oh, wow. Doug, that's a good question. (laughs) I pray that the legacy of Rachel Cruz would be going at the money message holistically, that I care as much about the person who's dealing with the money than just the money issues. And so looking at the person is really important. And that's my new book coming out, Know Yourself, Know Your Money. That's really where my heart came from was out of that of like, okay, tactically we know what to do. And I kind of even visualized it like, okay, there's a foundation and we build upon it so well at Ramsey. Like we're the best to show you how to budget and stick to it, how to get out of debt, how to invest, how to take your 30-year mortgage and turn it into a 15-year and refinance. Like we're good at building upon that foundation, but we haven't done a ton of work and content under under the foundation of the person and asking the question why, not just how. How do I handle my money? We answer, but why do I handle money the way we do is is just as crucial because when you can get a grip on this is why I do the things I do, whether it's because of fear, because of my dreams, because of my tendencies, because of how I grew up. When you can grasp that why, not only does that help yourself, I think, but I think it helps you win with money faster because you're able to put that to work. That does bring us to your book. It's dropping in January 2021. Is that right? That's right. Yes. And the title is Know Yourself, Know Your Money. Tell us a little bit about how you decided to write this book. What was the impetus 
that made you say, okay, we need to really write a mindset book about money? For me, over the last, gosh, probably three years, I have just had probably more self-awareness than I ever have in my life, Mm -hmm. thanks to Enneagram and counseling and like just really working on myself and understanding why I am the way I am. And I had so many light bulb moments because I realized self-awareness for self-awareness sake doesn't do much. But when you have self-awareness and you can use that as a tool to create healthier relationships within your marriage, as you're parenting, you know, with your family, with your friends, it can change so much in your life. And so during this time, I was like, well, how does that affect your money? Like, I wonder what that self-awareness can do towards your money. Why do I spend the things I spend? Why do I want quality things over quantity? Why do I, you know, I went through this whole kind of rabbit hole of all these questions and I thought, gosh, this could be a good book. (laughs) So I, yeah, so I started writing out of that, just thinking, I know that that whole genre has really helped me in life of just awakening and understanding myself more and to help walk people through that and do that for themselves when it comes to their money is something I'm really excited about. Can you give us a few specific examples of something you learned about yourself while researching this book that you didn't know before? Yes. Gosh, I, I read a whole section on fear and there's six financial fears I kind of break down and walk through and realizing that I, even though I am a spender, and I wave that flag proudly. I'm very proud to be a spender. One of my big fears is the lack of security of just knowing and making sure we're going to be okay. If something were to happen, I need to make sure we're okay. And it's actually the number one financial fear of women in America. And even though we have an emergency fund, we actually kind of have two emergency funds because I want two just to make sure, again, we're, we're, we're going to be okay no matter what. Like, It just explains why sometimes I, do can make, I can make decisions out of fear. While I am such a spender and I'm like, oh yeah... I still, I mean, this is a perfect example. We just bought airline tickets uh, over Labor Day weekend. And I was on the Southwest app buying Labor Day tickets or tickets over Labor Day because we were going to go to the beach with our family. We kind of decided a little bit spur of the moment for in a few months. And we're like, yeah, let's just book it. And I told my husband, I was like, I am like, I can have a pit in my stomach because I thought the tickets were going to be cheaper. I don't know if we can spend this. And he was like, babe, he was like talking back to me. He was like, look at the facts. Here's our budget. Here's what we said we can spend. The money's there. Just buy the tickets. But I still, even though I'm a spender, there was still a part of me that was like, I guess this is okay. So it's just, it's so interesting to me that I, I can, I can make those decisions on fear. And it just, as I was writing that section, I was like, man, that lack of security is still in me. Even though Winston and I, you know, have done this stuff for a decade, there's still a part of me that has that. I love the comparison of that fear and what it does to you, even after 10 years of of talking about this stuff, teaching, writing. When we talk about money and personal finance, a lot of people who've been thinking about this stuff deeply at some point say, well, it stops being about the money at some point. And I think in a sense, that's a little bit false. I remember talking to Jim Dolly from the White Coat Investor and You know, he said, it's really easy to say it's not about money, but if you think about money like oxygen, if you have no oxygen, then that's the most important thing. And that's what I love about the baby steps and getting out of debt. Those are like the initial oxygen when you have none. And unless someone puts that on you, you're in big trouble. But once you get that oxygen to a certain level, Getting more doesn't help anymore. And that's where I think your new book comes in, Know Yourself, Know Your Money, is once you get past that point, it's much more about mindset, understanding yourself, and understanding those patterns we have. Because, right, our brains don't stop working the way they did the first 20 or 30 years of our life just because we now have money or now have learned to manage Mm. our finances. Well said. Exactly. It is. And it's back to that 80-20 rule that it's about behavior. It's about you. But part of that behavior is understanding why do you do the things you do with money? And I think we all can get in these bad cycles sometimes. And so just to be even intentional to be aware of that is, is is a huge first step. So we know what's up next in your life. It is the dropping of this book in 2021 in January. What else is going on? Any other big projects you're particularly excited about? That's for sure the biggest one. I've shifted my show, the Rachel Cruz show, kind of formats, changed formats a little bit. So we're we're on the second month of this new format of the show, which is really exciting. So that's been a fun, a fun project. Tell us how the format has changed. 
we did a 30 minute half hour, well, even up to 45 minute show for probably two years with different segments. And we were thinking, okay, you know, originally let's make it shorter. Let's see if we can have drop different segments on different days versus it being one whole show and then enter March of 2020. And it kind of forced us to do that. I did so many things from home and the engagement level was out the roof compared to the 30 minute long version episode. And so we realized, oh, wow, we were leaning this way anyways, like intuitively. And then the pandemic made us do it. It forced us to change and it worked. So I was like, oh gosh, this is great. So, so yeah, so we've shifted, we've shifted that full time now. We had some episodes in the can that were 30 minutes that we would, we, that we put out throughout quarantine. But yeah, it's, it's three shorter episodes a week now, short, three shorter videos. And we just get to do more content and it's so fun. And if people want to know more about you, interact with you, buy the book or listen to the podcast, what's the best way for them to reach out? Yes, they can go to rachelcruz.com. Everything's there. And then of course, the show's on iTunes, uh, Google Play, wherever you get your podcasts. And the video version of the show is on YouTube and Facebook. Well, Rachel Cruz, I wanted to thank you for being on the show. I think you do such an amazing job of mixing both tactics and mindset. And I know that your book coming out soon will be a must read. These have been hard months that we've gone through. There has been a lot changing. And I think the best way to make it through is to listen to smart people who talk eloquently about these things like you. Thanks for being on the show. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. That's a wrap. In the first part of the show, we talked to Rachel Cruz about not just the tactics, but the mindset behind dealing with your personal finances. After the break, we discussed with Ashley Barnett, the art of blogging. But first, hey, have you been enjoying the Earn and Invest podcast? It has been my utter privilege to bring these guest panelists and these views to you. But you know what? It also helps when you get out there and tell people about the Earn and Invest podcast. In fact, that's really the major way people learn about what we discuss here today. It comes from you. And whether that be in person, when you're at a meeting or a get together or gathering, or on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, what have you, The best people to let everyone know how good Earn and Invest could be are you, all you out there, the listeners. So do me a favor and let a friend, family member, follower, social acquaintance know about the Earn and Invest podcast. Also, you can leave us a review, especially on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this today. Tell us what you think of the podcast. Give us a star rating. We would love to hear your feedback and spread the word because that's how this podcast will grow. That's how our community will become bigger and more rich and fuller. And hopefully for you guys as well as me, if you haven't signed up for our Facebook group yet, please go to facebook.com slash group slash earn and invest and request to become a member. There we discuss many things very similar to what you hear on the podcast, but with you, the community. We'd love to hear from you. Happy holidays, everybody. Now back to the show. I am so excited to have my friend Ashley Barnett on the show. Ashley and I have met multiple times in person We go to this meeting, this get-together called FinCon that is for digital producers and creators every year. And it's like the minute I get there, I run into you, Ashley, every single time. It's like we have like a set lunch that first day. (laughs) It's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's because I just hang out in the lobby so that I can see everyone as they come in. (laughs) That's it. We're both lobby rats. (laughs) I really enjoyed meeting you the first time, especially because at that time I was big into blogging and Ashley has created a platform called Hit Publish, which pretty much helps bloggers create the best content on the internet. So this is something a lot of us think we're supposed to just know right off the bat, but it takes a little practice and coaching to actually get the blog thing down. It does. Yeah. This is not something anybody's taught in school, right? How to write for a blog. 
Um, and even people who have just natural, natural good writing abilities or just naturally good writers don't necessarily know how to write for a blog. I certainly did not consider myself a good writer when I started blogging. That was in 06. So it's a skill that I have been cultivating for a long time. And it's not, you're not writing an essay for school. You're not writing an email. It's very, it's a very specific type of writing. It does, you do have to learn it. And it's almost a little misleading, right? Because the barriers to publication have become so low, even as your title says, all you have to do nowadays is hit publish. (laughs) But the story is a little more complicated than that because we're not taught in school how to write engaging blog posts. Right. Uh, Yeah, anybody can hit publish. But if you want people to actually read it, you want to actually impact people's lives, if you want to get famous doing it, it has to be high quality. Yeah. (laughs) So before you help teach us how to be better bloggers, I feel like I have to ask the big question, and I apologize for this from the beginning, but is blogging still alive and well? I have heard the calls that blogging is dead way back in 2010, and I heard it in 2015, and still there are people saying it in 2020. Yeah. How fertile a field are web blogs? I mean, they still drive a ton of traffic. They're still making people rich. They're still making people famous. They're still impacting a lot of lives. To say the written word is going to go away is crazy. Books aren't going away. I mean, I guess newspapers are kind of going away, (laughs) but written content is, I mean, realistically, it's never going to go away. I know that there is always a push to look at the newest, best, and greatest, which has moved people to podcasting. And even podcasting has now playing second fiddle to Instagram Live and Facebook Live and YouTube. Yet the durability of blogging has lasted. I mean, I, I called it a web blog because that's what we used to call it in 2005. Right. I started blogging about medicine at just the same time. And there certainly have been ebbs and flows, but the medium has continued and flourished. There are more blogs than ever and certainly more blogs than podcasts or YouTube channels, right? Yeah. Yeah, the competition is definitely stronger in blogging. I, I'm i going by memory here, but it's something like 20 million blog posts are published every day, um, which sounds overwhelming. And so maybe that's why people are saying like, it's too, you can't really start today because it's too, it's too crowded. But that, I don't think that's true at all. And I mean, you don't have to compete against all 20 million blog posts. You're only competing against people in your niche who are talking to your audience, which is very few. And there may be millions of blogs, but it appears that there are billions of eyes now on the internet. (laughs) (laughs) So each of us could have, you know, an audience of a thousand or 2000 or even 10,000 people. And there would still be lots and lots of people to go around to look at all those blogs. Absolutely. I feel like there's a quintessential question when it comes to blogging is what reigns supreme content versus marketing? Cause I've seen a lot of really bad blogs out there who, yeah. that seem to get a lot of viewership. Yeah, they really, it is like, it's two sides of the coin, right? Um, your marketing isn't going to work if your blog isn't worth reading, if the content isn't high quality and helpful. Um, but no one's going to read it if they don't know it exists. So it does have to be, you know, you do have to write well and helpful content, and then you also have to market it. Most, most bloggers don't fail in the marketing section. Most blogs are marketed, but the content is not high quality and that's why they have trouble getting traction. I very, very rarely see a blog that is just excellent and super helpful and really thought out high quality articles that isn't being marketed. That's That's really actually very reassuring because people forget the fact that even if you can get the eyes, if you are not presenting something engaging, people won't stay. That traffic won't be sticky. Right. And you won't be meeting your goals because of it. Yeah, exactly. So as of today, 2020, going into 2021, what do you think are the biggest friction points for bloggers, especially someone who's new to the genre, who's just starting out? What what do they get caught up on? Yeah, that's a really good question. There is 
a ton of information. I think if I was starting today, I think that would be the hardest part is being able to sift through. Like there is so much information out there and it's so like, if you ask a question in a, in a blog or a Facebook group, say you're going to get 20 answers and 10 will contradict the other 10, you mm-hmm. know, it, Oh, you absolutely have to do this. And then someone else is like, Oh, never do that. And it's like, well, what am I supposed to do then? <laughs> you know, um, Unlike when we started, there was no one helping. There was no tools. There was no plugins. There was no nothing. Nobody knew what they were doing. I know for me, when I started, most of the way you got readership was through community. You read someone else's blog. You left a comment. They checked out your blog. Commenting was really big. This idea of SEO, search engine optimization, didn't seem to play as big of a role. I know for me... SEO was a big stumbling point because it was this yeah. big black box mm-hmm. that I didn't understand. I could always understand, write a good post. I could understand, go and engage with other people on their blogs. But search engine optimization is something I definitely stumbled on. That's a, yeah, that's really, that's really good. Same here. I, and I avoided it for a really long time. Keyword research and SEO. I was like, oh, I don't do that. Like, I felt like writing to SEO or writing to Google was going to somehow like cheapen my article. And that may have been the case back in the day where it was all just so heavy keyword based and people would even have like white text at the end of the article with just like just keyword stuffing that you couldn't actually see it, but Google could read it. So that has definitely changed. Google doesn't I mean, keywords are still important. I don't want to say that, but every update that comes out through Google is really all about like reader experience and meeting the reader's intent when they search and and high quality posts versus making sure you have your exact keyword in your article like 10 times or something like that, which is how it kind of was back back in the day. I like this idea of having a high quality post and that be the guiding principle. It's a double edged sword. You can spend a lot of time on SEO and really get your article pristine, but then Google can also change their algorithms and that pristine article in six months may not be as popular as you thought it would be. That's true. And I mean, that's, that's just life on the internet, I think. Uh, But if you always if you always approach your article as just trying to be as useful and helpful as you can, I think you're going to survive that stuff a lot easier than if you're like trying to trick Google into, into sending you traffic and you need to have a, like you're dealing with algorithms all over the place, right? Google algorithms, but all of your social media has algorithms. Even your email has stats that it's following. You know, if, if a certain number of people mark you as spam, it's not going to, send your stuff anymore. Uh, so you're, you know, you're always dealing with these computer generated ideas of who wants to see your content. If you just come at it with this pure heart of, I just want to help people and I'm going to put out the best content that I can, you're going to avoid a ton of problems with the algorithms. So we've talked a little bit about Google and we've talked about SEO as well as making a high quality blog posts what role does social media play in? And do you have any advice for people who are trying to navigate how much social media to be involved in and what role it plays in marketing your blog post? Yeah, it's it plays a huge role. The best thing to really do when you're just starting us for sure is to choose one platform that you're going to focus on and really like kill, right? You're just going to nail this one platform uh, because they are all so different. And what is considered spam on one is perfectly fine on another. And there's just a lot of, there's a culture on each one that you need to figure out and play into. So, you know, grab your social handles on all of the platforms so that you have them and no one can get them from you. Uh, But focus really on one platform, build a following there, just, you know, be popular, kill it. And then you can add in another one later if you want to. Uh, Pinterest. Pinterest is probably the best one for driving traffic. Um, Facebook is tough because their algorithms really don't like people to leave Facebook. So any like external link out is not, they don't want to show that. 
Instagram is great for engagement. It's hard to get people to click through because you only have the one link in your profile and that's it. Uh, but Pinterest is designed to drive traffic to blogs. Like the only people who post on Pinterest are content creators. Like regular users who don't have a blog or don't produce content on the internet, they're not putting stuff on Pinterest the way like regular users are using Instagram or Facebook. So if really, in, in my opinion, if you're going to pick one, it would be Pinterest, assuming that your content is you know friendly for Pinterest. Yeah, I have two thoughts on that. One is people don't realize that Pinterest is a huge search engine. Yeah. So it's actually meant to help people find your content, which yeah. if you can master it or at least understand it, it can be incredibly helpful. The other, you know, piece of advice I would give people is don't start with Reddit. <laughs> Whatever you do, <laughs> it is way too complex of a medium for the beginner. <laughs> I don't, I've never, I haven't spent much time on Reddit, honestly. <laughs> yes. Yes. You're probably smart for that. <laughs> so the big question in everyone's mind when it comes to blogging for better or for worse is how do I make money at it? Talk to us a little bit about the different ways of making money through blogging. Yeah. So a really popular way is affiliate marketing through affiliate sales. So you'll sign up with a company. Amazon is you know, an easy one to sign up for. It's a good example. Um, let's say I have a blog on running, right? I'm a runner and I write all this content about running. And so you might recommend shoes, right? And you'd have a list of these are popular running shoes. And if somebody reads that article, clicks on a link, goes over to Amazon, you would get a commission for selling that shoe. So that's affiliate marketing. And then there's display ads where you everybody has seen this on the internet. You're on an article and there's just a random ad right in the middle of the, of the article, which can be annoying if it's too much. Uh, but every time you see one of those, the blogger is getting paid a tiny bit for the fact that it was displayed for you. And so if you just have traffic, like just tons and tons of traffic, you can make a lot of money just on display ads. And then there's sponsored content. So somebody might give you a couple hundred bucks or even a couple thousand dollars if your site's big to have a full article all about them. And you'll see that too. There'll be um, sometimes reviews are sponsored and sometimes they're just for affiliates, but you would write an article that is specifically all about this one company and they'd pay you to publish that. Or you could also just do it in email. They'll pay for a sponsored email for you to send out to your list. So it's notable, especially in the beginning of your blogging journey, your pay per hour of work is not going to be that no. great. So I no. know you've worked for a bunch of seven figure blogs, but for the majority, it's a lot of work for a little money, especially yes. in the beginning. Yes. People say that blogging is like passive income, which is completely not true. <laughs> it's a business full on. Sometimes people will say passive, um, active work, passive income, because you're not getting paid for your work, but the, the income comes passively. Yeah, it's you have to you have to do it because you love it, and if it turns into a business, great. Um, you can have the intention that it will hopefully make money someday. But if you start a blog with just like I'm going to make money, this is my business, it's going to be you're going to quit before you ever make money because you have to do it because you love it. And you, this is information that you feel driven to put out into the world. We, we were at some blogger meetup and I made a joke that was like, I, I would have quit a long time ago if I could, this is not something I can stop <laughs> doing. You know? Yeah. It's buyer just... beware. Once you get started, you make, <laughs> it's really hard to give it up. You know, especially like personal finance is such a, it's a passion topic. Like it really want to put this out information out into the world. It has to be said. Um, if you don't feel that way about your topic, you probably won't make it. One of the most successful ways I see people make money in the blogging world is their blog is a funnel and creates community to sell other things, either courses or yeah. books they've written or to start mastermind groups, paid mastermind groups. It yeah. I like hadn't thought good... about that. I hadn't said that. Yeah. But selling your own products is another great mm -hmm. way to make money. Your audience can be smaller and sell your own products. Like you might have to have say 50,000 page views a month to make money on 
display ads, but you might be able to sell your own products with only 2000 page views a month. So you can sell it a lot quicker if, if you show yourself as an expert. So I'm sure there are a lot of people listening right now who are thinking about starting their own blog. Are there some quintessential no-nos, like things you absolutely should avoid when you start your blog? Yeah. Don't use one of the free blogging services like Blogger or Wix or um, those type. Um, when It's not your business if you have it on someone else's platform. They own your content. They can tell you what you can and cannot do. You really do want to have a self-hosted WordPress site. There's also the credibility issue, right? Sometimes when people go to your site, if they see a Blogspot or a Weebly or one of the free versions, there's just that air of credibility may not be there, especially if you're a business. Yeah, I mean, if if you're starting a blog with the intention that someday you may make money, you want to own it. If you're just starting a hobby blog for your parents to read about your kids, that's fine. You can use a free platform, no big deal. Um, But if you really want this to be a business, you need to build it on your own platform. Yeah. Same reason why putting all your content out onto social media and not having it housed somewhere is important because those algorithms can change, that social Mm -hmm. media platform can come and go. But if you don't own, for instance, your email list or your content in one central place, which for a lot of people is their blog or their website... Uh, it could disappear. Yeah, absolutely. You hear all the time people just get kicked off Facebook for really no reason at all. And their whole business is gone. So we're going to talk in a moment about the courses you offer through Hit Publish. But I was just wondering, are there any big trends right now in blogging that are the newest and greatest? Anything big happening right now that that people are jumping onto? So really just making sure that your content is complete and really answers the question and matches the user intent. That's really important on Google. When So when someone Googles something and anything, whatever you type into Google is the keyword. So whenever somebody enters something into Google, they have in their mind kind of what information they're looking for. And that is their, in, that is their user intent. And so you need to make sure that you're hitting that. If you don't, you'll, Google will never feature you for that. So when you are deciding on what keyword you want to go for, you want to make sure you kind of take a look at those ranking articles and see what intent they are ma- they're matching. So for example, if I Google hot air balloons, if you sell hot air balloons, that's probably not going to come up because if you Google hot air balloons, it's all places that do hot air balloon rides. Everything that comes up on that search is places that offer hot air balloon rides. So if you are making a craft about hot air balloons and you want this to rank for hot air balloons, it's never going to because it doesn't match the user intent. So you'd want to go for something like hot air balloon craft or something like that. So you hit on an important point, and this is a good transition into talking about your platform, Hit Publish, and the courses you offer. What you were just talking about, hot air balloons, I would never know unless I had someone like you to tell me about it. Tell us a little bit about your course offerings. Uh, What courses are available to people who want to up their blogging game? Yeah, so I have two main courses. The first one is for kind of newer bloggers. I define that as blogging for about a year or so. And it is how to create great content, how to make sure that your content is helpful and useful and is ready for the internet. And I, you know, I pull on my 15 years of experience and seven of that is editing, especially for larger personal finance blogs. I've edited, conservatively, I say edited 3000 articles. So I have seven to do today. So (laughs) it's, I edit, I see a lot of articles. Um, The other course is freelance writing for bloggers. This is for bloggers who want to get into freelance writing. So this is for somebody who wants that laptop lifestyle. Uh, Maybe their blog isn't making money yet. Freelance writing is a great way to make money blogging um, while you're kind of waiting for your site to get to the levels where you can start making money. And then on top of that, you also offer personal coaching for someone who's looking for that next level advice on how to maybe mastermind their future of blogging. Yeah, I do have coaching available as well as consulting. So if you are 
ready to really take your site to the next level, like you're making some money and you want to start bringing on a team. Um, I offer consulting for that as far as really starting to build that team and put those systems into place so that you can really, you know, turn, turn this blog that has been a hobby, maybe start making some money and really start making, turning it into a real business. Well, the platform is hitpublish.com, right? Hitpublish.com. Yes. There are a lot of people blogging out there, but not all of them are high quality and not all content is good content. So if you, like me, are out there struggling trying to make your blog post really have a major effect, get it out there so people will read it. Come check out Hit Publish. Ashley Barnett, thank you for being on the thank show. You. Long live blogging. <laughs> Thank you. It was great. Hey, everybody. No blooper section this week. I just wanted to wish everybody a happy holidays and a happy new year. I hope the end of December proves to be much better than the rest of 2020. I will be thinking of all you and can't wait to get 2021 started with brand new episodes of the Earn and Invest podcast. Can't wait to hear from you all. Happy holidays.